Hello, and welcome to Revolutionary Ideas, the monthly Marxist podcast from Socialist Alternative. The capitalist class always wants to tell us how their system works. Like an invisible hand, the market delivers for everyone, or so we're told. But how does capitalism really work? In answering this, Marxist economics is an incredibly powerful tool for socialists to use today. In this episode to discuss this, our regular panellists Connor and Yara will be interviewing Tom Crean, who's from Socialist Alternative in the US. With that being said, I will just hand over to you three now. So we're joined here today by Tom Crean from the US section of Socialist Alternative and the editor of our journal Socialist World. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. And today we're going to be talking about Marxist economics, which is obviously a huge subject, but I think we should be able to explore it and and talk about the important relevance of it right now in society. So maybe the best place to start is to talk about what really were the main kind of insights that Karl Marx made around political economy when he did his writings and research on economics. Okay, well, that's that's a a very big question. Um, But I I think the most important thing that Marx contributed um, to our understanding of economics was to put the economy into its political and historical context. You know, at the start of the Communist Manifesto, he says, uh, he and Engels say that the history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggle. And he looked at any given society um, and, and, and at the, uh, what he called the mode of production that underlay its social structure. And that mode of production is the way basically the economy is organized. And a feudal economy is organized very differently to a capitalist economy. In terms of capitalism, which obviously the system we live under and that has dominated the world for a whole period of time began in Europe a few hundred years ago, you know, you often see reference to the labor theory of value. Uh, that isn't completely Marx's creation, but he uh, drew a number of conclusions from the essential idea that labor gives commodities their value. And he characterized uh, capitalism as generalized commodity production. I think all of us feel that, you know, like basically everything can be a commodity. Everything is for sale under capitalism. They constantly find new ways to turn, you know, any aspect of life into a commodity. But what is, in an economic sense, the source of the value? It's the application of labor. And... He also, and I, this is the final thing I'll say about this, he identified how the capitalists uh, create or, or how they uh, gain what he called their surplus value, their profit. Um, and that's through basically paying workers only part of the value that they create uh, in, in the form of wages so that the rest of the day workers essentially work for free. Um, and that part of the labor day is... Uh, is what he called surplus value. So that's extremely thumbnail. Yeah, I think this is really interesting, especially in the context of today, because like you mentioned, we're talking about a period that is quite a long time ago. And obviously there was kind of like the progression from feudalism into capitalism. But we are now 150 years later, if not more, than when Marx came up with this theory. Um, And you're talking about kind of the basics of the economy. And I was wondering, can you kind of tell us a little bit about how that relates to kind of the stage of capitalism that we're in now? Well, yes, I think this this, uh, this is a really important point because what I, as I said before, Marx looked at uh, modes of production and how they succeeded each other historically. There there was uh, in, in, In European history, you know, you had antiquity and classical slave society, feudalism, and now capitalism. But each mode of production um, is characterized by um, a period when it's it's, uh, contributing to the development of the productive forces of society, when it's essentially a progressive um, development. And then uh, a period of decline 
uh, which ultimately leads to the mode of production being replaced. And, and essentially what happens is that a new social class emerges in a given society uh, as the capitalists emerge in feudal society, and they basically break uh, the, the, uh, the bounds of that society at a certain stage and uh, start anew. And so we can see how that happened with the bourgeois revolution. Um, as you said, that was a couple hundred years ago in Europe, but capitalism itself had a period when you could say it was progressive, it, it helped develop the forces of production. But then I would say since the end of the 19th century uh, or the beginning of the 20th century, it has reached in general certain limits. It is no longer a progressive system in that sense. But even within that, there are still other specific phases. Like the period between the two world wars was very different to the period after the war, World War II, and to neoliberalism. Yeah, I think identifying these trends in the system was one of the really important things that Marx did, in my opinion. So looking at both the way societies, as you say, kind of uh, are in their ascendancy and then in a period of decline and uh, are eventually overthrown. But also other trends that we see under capitalism that we can kind of talk about through the history of this mode of production. So globalization or uh, centralization of, of wealth and this kind of thing. And I think that that's something that really sheds a lot of light on things in a way that, uh, you know, you wouldn't really kind of have otherwise. No, I, I agree. Um, I mean, if you take globalization uh, specifically, this is an underlying trend in, in capitalism. I mean, in, again, to go back to the Communist Manifesto, you know, Marx has a whole passage where he talks about, you know, how um, how capitalism is transforming the world and creating a world economy. And this was at a point where, you know, in 1848, uh, the world economy didn't really exist in the full-fledged sense that we see today. But he was absolutely prescient on this point. And by the end of the 19th century, you had uh, a large element of globalization. Um, I was just reading... I'm reading uh, AJP Taylor's book from, uh, I think it's called from Sarajevo to Potsdam, but he describes that right before World War I in Europe, you could travel without a passport. Um, you, it wasn't exactly like the EU, um, but uh, that, that really there had been a very significant um, element of globalization that had been uh, created. And then that was reversed between the wars um, because capitalism had run up against uh, certain very definite obstacles. And one of the key contradictions in capitalism is between that trend to develop the world economy and the nation state. Capitalism is ultimately the prisoner of uh, the nation state political form. And that we see very, very dramatically today where, yes, we had, you know, a phase of globalization that went very far um, over the past a few decades. And now we have the, uh, the vehement reassertion of the nation state, especially in the conflict between, uh, the, between US uh, imperialism and rising Chinese imperialism. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. And I wanna kind of ask you a couple of questions about that because I think what we talked about, kind of the, the labor theory of value, I think that is really important to everything that we do as socialists now, because one of the most kind of prominent ideas that we have is the strike about how workers stopping to work actually helps not just their rights, but kind of shows the impact of the work the workers do on society and also on the capitalist system as a whole and on the profits. And I think it's it's very clear, like, I think it, it's kind of instinctive to a lot of people that you have all of these resources, you have all of these natural resources as well, but without the work that workers actually do, you don't get that value. And without the exploitation of that labor, the capitalists are not making the value. And then you started talking about the contradictions of capitalism. And I think as really... Like, I think one of the, the biggest contradictions is how kind of capitalism created the working class while by exploiting their labor. 
and that working class is going to be the end of capitalism as well. But you started talking about one kind of contradiction, the one about um, kind of the nation state versus globalization, how capitalism has to have a kind of a global sense in order to produce. And also it started from kind of a global market as well that allowed the accumulation of that much wealth. Um, by the same time, it relies on the nation state. So can you talk us through a couple, like, uh, the, because I think everyone kind of talks about the contradictions of capitalism now. So can you tell us a little bit more about what these are? Yeah, I, I, I'll do that. I'm just, I, but I think the, the point you made there about um, the role of the working class, now people are focusing more on that today, I think is uh, a very important point. You know, especially in this pandemic, people have seen the role of essential workers and, uh, you know, they've been brought back to, you know, who is it that's really doing the, the necessary work and what part of society is actually essential and what part is superfluous uh, in terms of creating what we need. Um, so I just, you know, and I think that's, that's a very important point. Um, in terms of the contradictions, um, capitalism, as Marx explained, is a boom bust system. Um, and during that, that you know, phase when you have uh, an increasing expansion of the economy, there's a natural tendency for it to overheat. And the form that this takes is, uh, as Marx described it, is the overaccumulation of, of capital. And that can take different forms. One form it can take is simply the, the overproduction of, of goods. And in the past period, um, under neoliberalism, what we saw was a massive uh, rise in inequality um, and a massive rise in the level of exploitation. But one of the consequences of this is that workers are not in a position to buy back all the wealth that's being created. And this can be masked, you know, as it was under neoliberalism by a massive extension of credit and so forth. But at some point that can express itself, you know, very sharply in a crisis of demand that there's simply not enough uh, demand to absorb. And, and I should stress, you know, we talk about supply, you know, you hear about supply and demand as these two categories. If you do not, have money, you have no demand. You could be starving to death, but if you don't have money, you have no demand. Demand is, you know, not just the need, but to have the means to pay for. Um, there's also what Marx uh, talks about, the tendency of the rate of profit to fall. And that uh, in a nutshell is that it, in the course of, you know, any, um, a boom period, there's a, an increasing tendency to bring in new technology. But the more that the capitalists invest in new technology, which Marx calls dead labor, I mean, because it took labor to create the technology as well. So, you know, but, but that is a fixed cost. And as that fixed cost grows, it squeezes out uh, living labor. But that's the actual source of profit is living labor. So, that can create essentially a, a squeeze on profits. Uh, but it's a tendency, it's not necessarily what happens in every crisis. Crises are caused by different uh, specific features and then they have underlying uh, causes. So, you know, 12 years ago, the cause of the, the, finance, of the, of the crisis was um, in, the, in the financial markets, the derivatives, subprime loans, all that, you know, leading to the banks a number of banks uh, being on the verge of collapse. Last year, the trigger of the crisis was the pandemic. But even before that, ISA explained that there were underlying causes pointing towards a slowdown of the world economy. And if you look at productivity, for example, uh, the growth of productivity has slowed and slowed for over the course of decades. And uh, the capitalists do not, in general, see um, profitable um, fields for investment. So what they generally have been doing is pouring their capital into excess capital into um, the, the financial casino rather than into productive investment. 
I think this point about contradictions is really important. And of course, at the beginning uh, of that uh, question, we were talking a little bit about the kind of international nature of capitalism, but its limitations as a result of its organisation on the basis of nation states and this kind of thing. I think this this very podcast, the fact that we're able to have this discussion with uh, with you from the US while we're here in Britain uh, really shows that. But at the same time, uh, there are all these huge issues. There's uh, the lack of cooperation around climate change is one huge factor at the moment, but also the lack of cooperation, the the tendencies away from uh, international uh, kind of globalization that we're seeing as well at the moment. All of these things are part of that contradiction. And then this other one, this theory of crisis, I think that's absolutely fundamental to what Marx is talking about. And really a, a huge kind of point when we're, when we're kind of uh, criticizing capitalism is not just to say that uh, the systems may be, you know, exploitative, although Marx does say it is, and I'd say he's right in in calling it exploitative, but also that it's you know it's fundamentally broken, and every every few years it falls into these crises, and it's incapable of avoiding them just because of the the way the system works, the way that workers aren't paid the full value of what they produce, and uh, and that there's more produced than can be bought back. Sorry to interrupt. This is just to give you a reminder that if you have liked what you've heard so far, make sure you get in touch with Socialist Alternative today. Follow us on all of our social media platforms. On Facebook, we're Socialist Alternative ISA England, Wales and Scotland. On Instagram, we're Socialist Alternative dot EWS. On Twitter, Socialist Alt EWS. And last but not least, on TikTok, we are Socialist underscore vids. If you'd like to learn a bit more about us and join our struggle, then go to socialistalternative.net and click on Get Involved to leave your details. Anyway, back to the podcast. I think this also comes back to the previous question about like the long-term trends in capitalism. Because as I was saying, you know, if you if you go back to World War One, World War One itself was an expression of the the profound contradictions of capitalism. Um, you know, the the divide division of the world into into markets, the competition between different imperialist powers. Um, and what that was followed by was this long period between the, the wars uh, where capitalism uh, was essentially stagnant. I mean, it doesn't, I, that doesn't mean that there was no growth, but uh, there was no way for the capitalist system to, to find um, a sustained path to further development. And then, of course, you had the Great Depression, um, which was, you know, the biggest crisis capitalism uh, had faced uh, to date. Um, and all of that is followed by World War II. But the peculiar thing is that World War II and the massive destruction that it entailed and a number of other very specific factors allowed capitalism to, in a sense, reestablish itself, uh, to have the period of greatest expansion that it had ever um, achieved um, for about 25 years. Um, even then there were recessions, but they were relatively mild. Um, and, and then of course you have, you know, at the end of that, the neoliberal era where they basically, you know, massively increased the rate of exploitation, attacked gains working people had made in the past, privatized everything they could. Then they had the benefit of the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, to create and and the opening up of China as a capitalist country to you know new new markets, and they've kind of run out of all these things now, and you know so we have this crisis which which we've last year's and this year's crisis the biggest drop last year in uh, global GDP since the Great Depression, but in reality it, this began in two thousand eight two thousand nine, um, you know they are now in a phase which has more in common with the interwar period when there's no way to kind of reestablish equilibrium. And they're telling us now that, you know, well, there's going to be a big rebound, but how are they achieving this rebound by the most almighty use of fiscal and monetary firepower, you know, ever deployed, um, which certainly contradicts the idea of a free market. 
uh, you know, what free market uh, in, the, in this situation. Um, but this is, you know, and, and, and that's, and then they don't even discuss, you know, the climate crisis in connection with this. But that's, of course, the next thing that's going to undermine uh, the global economy. Yeah, and I think all of these contradictions are massive. And like, I think the way that Mars kind of drew them out in a way that explained that the system, it's not its not kind of like a morality issue, it's not whether the system is good for people or bad for people, it's just a system that is doomed to fail, um, which I think you we, we can see in a lot of the ways like you've described throughout history and today definitely after two crises, one after the other. And I think that kind of really shows that these ideas, like you said, of the free market or the invisible hand that just sorts the market in everyone's benefit. And that's why we don't need any regulation or any support. That that kind of shows how Marx's theory is completely correct. And I was wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about how Marx's theory of everything that we talked about, about those contradictions of capitalism, about uh, the value of labor, how that's different to kind of the way the capitalists see the economy? Well, I mean, capitalists themselves are very pragmatic people in general, and, you know, they're not too interested, most of them in, in theory, but but obviously you do have um, bourgeois economics, which, uh, you know, it's like, it's, it's like modern theology, you know, um, it's, uh, no matter how many times it's contradicted by reality, it doesn't stop them carrying on with um, you know, with, with propositions that often are just obviously un, untrue. Um, but I mean, the central, the central proposition of bourgeois economics, uh, or, or its task is to obscure the labor theory of value, to obscure exploitation, the source of, uh, the, the wealth in society. Um, and that's obviously because of the class interests that it, uh, that it represents. Now, more there, there is, of course, serious, I mean, that is a serious thing, but, you know, there, there is, it's not to say that bourgeois economics doesn't have any element of, um, of serious analysis because they need, you know, they do need to be able to project or to understand aspects of what's going on and, and to try to come up with solutions. So um, a lot of bourgeois economics uh, is, is relating to trying to find some kind of cure to the boom-bust uh, problem. Um, and so I'll just, I'll list some of those uh, for you. Um, obviously there's Keynesianism and I think we are hearing more about John Maynard Keynes. Mm -hmm. Keynes's theory is quite popular, for example, uh, uh, in sections of the American left, um, even if people don't always refer to him explicitly, but, but there's, you know, the, there's the popularity, for example, of Roosevelt, um, and the New Deal, um, and Keynes' ideas play an important role in the in the New Deal. Uh, and I think the thing we have to understand is it wasn't, um, you know, it was not a pro-worker set of ideas. It was an attempt to save capitalism from itself. And the way that is done, uh, according to Keynes, is by counter-cyclical measures, uh, by propping up demand. So, you know, if... Um, what part of that being like what we now would be calling stimulus measures, um, or in the case of the New Deal, um, directly employing large numbers of people by the state uh, then to carry out public works and, you know, and so forth. Uh, and it is quite impressive what was done during the New Deal when you get into it, uh, some aspects of it. Um, of course, as Leon Trotsky said, it was an American policy par excellence. It was not something that could be done by most countries. It required, you know, the, the kind of resources uh, that uh, the U.S. Um, reserves, you know, that the U.S. had. Um, but here's the, the, the real kicker. It didn't really solve the problem. Um, you know, you had the stock market crash, 29, big drop in 31. And then in 37, the economy went over the cliff again. The only thing that brought the the um, the U.S. out of the Great Depression was war production, World War II, and then, you know, as I said before, the massive destruction of World War II, the horrific catas catastrophe that that was, actually laid the basis for the renewal of capitalism. 
Um, so, you know, at best you can say the Keynesian measures um, can alleviate a crisis um, or aid a recovery, but they, they, they cannot get rid of the boom bust nature of, of, of the system itself. I think that's an incredibly important point, actually, uh, the fact that it really can't get past these baked in problems with the system, not just the boom and bust, but also I, I, I don't think Keynesianism can really uh, answer problems uh, like exploitation, for instance, either. But also, you know, one of, one of the things with Marxist economics and a Marxist approach is that we see it as a tool for struggle. And that's another thing that I think bourgeois economics of any kind uh, doesn't really have that perspective. So as socialists, uh, you know, we're, we're very limited if we're just talking about clever policy decisions. Um, what, what's really much more powerful is an understanding that workers are brought together by this system, that we produce this surplus, that we can fight for control of that surplus, whether for higher wages or taxing the rich, but also, you know, fundamentally not just sticking within capitalism, but our ability to change the system as well and, and, and establish an economy where we have control over the wealth that's produced in society and, and can plan that ourselves too. So this was a point I wanted to come back to earlier. I think it's um, that Yara had raised, and I think it's uh, it's very important that, of course, the source of the capitalist profits of their wealth is the exploitation of labor. But that's always done within a particular social context, and the actual rate of exploitation is not some some given. You know, the working class can by organizing itself. Um, and fighting back by taking strike action and, and stopping production, uh, it can lower the rate of exploitation and increase the share that's coming to it. It can't ultimately, uh, you, you can't, um, you know, strike your way out of exploitation, but you can, uh, if the working class is powerful, it can reduce uh, the level of exploitation. And after World War II, part of the reason why, you know, you had this massive boom, but you also had uh, a very powerful working class, uh, well-organized, and it was able to demand a higher share of the wealth in the context of a very big boom. But these are not the conditions that we exist in today. Um, you know, capitalism has less and less ability to deliver uh, a better life, you know, um, it's true that it is a distribution problem, as Yara said, but it's, you know, it's also at a more fundamental level that it can't, um, it can't actually answer the needs of uh, the people of the world. I mean, if you do not have the ability to have a coordinated plan to deal with this pandemic, uh, how are you going to have a coordinated plan to deal with the climate crisis? And if you can't do that, then the very basis of, um, you know, quote unquote civilization is, is undermined. And uh, that's, that's kind of where we're at. We, we have to figure out a way to get rid of the system itself. I think that like one thing that you said there before, uh, which is that all of these kind of capitalist theories or kind of models or models to change the economy are all kind of ways to kind of save capitalism from itself. And the only way for us to save ourselves from capitalism is through kind of Marxist analysis and also action. Um, so I was wondering if we can kind of take on this, because obviously this is a theory, an economic theory. It's not just, you know, words and paper. It's meant to be used. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if... We can take this crisis, for example. You talked a bit about that, and I think the example of the pandemic is a fantastic example. Like, I think there was something like 250 different variations of vaccines that were under research and still are under research, even though there are vaccines that work. And that that's just, you know, it's preposterous. Like, just thinking about how much manpower, how many resources, how many brains and working class talent went into producing 250 different variations of the vaccine instead of 
trying to fix this problem and working together to produce on a mass scale enough vaccines for everyone, including in the neocolonial world, and to do it as quickly and as efficiently as possible. Instead of that, we have competing companies and competing countries working against it, which is to our detriment at the end of the day. Um, so I was wondering how, so not just for the health crisis, but generally for the economic crisis, I think we've pointed out a few times that, it, that even though the pandemic kind of accelerated this process, that it wasn't the cause of this current crisis that we have. So how would you take the Marxist economic theory and apply it to today? What, what is uh, kind of, what, what are we facing next? So, um, whatever rebound happens, it's going to be very temporary. And there's then going to be another phase of this crisis. So that's why it's a bit like the 1930s. And there's just no, they don't have any path to, you know, restoring even the kind of stability that you would have said was there in the 90s or in the, in the 2000s. You know, it's just, it's increasingly unstable situation. And that then has many repercussions politically. You know, we've already seen how polarization, political polarization has grown so extreme, you know, that you have these, uh, you know, right-wing populists on the one side, authoritarian regimes, but you also have had massive revolts in country after country. You know, obviously here in the US, we had Bernie Sanders on the one side and we had Trump on the other. In a way, both of those phenomena were expressions of the crisis of neoliberalism, you know, and that the center no longer holds. Um, the ruling class is discredited, discredited, its institutions are discredited. So, you know, we've really entered a new phase. And actually, in this new phase, they're abandoning, I mean, almost on a daily basis, they're, they're just jettisoning elements of neoliberal ideology, you know, and um, they're turning to nationalism. They're turning to, um, uh, to the idea that the state should intervene into the economy. Um, I could go on about that, but anyway, uh, but those are some of the things that we're seeing and that we're going to continue to see. Those trends that you talked about just at the end there, I think, are hugely important and they're going to be a real defining factor, I think, as well, uh, going forward. So, I mean, you've talked a bit about the kind of rise of... Uh, uh, nationalism also of course policy like state spending fuels that further that kind of national policy we've also got the uh, US China conflict that we've already talked a little bit about this rising Chinese imperialism that's that's coming up against that of the US 20 years ago uh, in in this very kind of stable period of ascendant neoliberalism uh, China and the US uh, the, the cooperation between those two countries was a key part of the way the world economy worked and now that's going sharply actually into the other direction so i was wondering maybe if uh, you wanted to talk a little bit about that situation and how that's developing i think anybody who was expecting that joe biden's administration would mean a change in the direction of the us china conflict uh you know has certainly been uh, disabused of that my news feed is constantly telling me here in the us about the imminence of war uh, over Taiwan. And I don't think this is a complete joke. Um, I'm not saying that's what's gonna happen tomorrow, but it's just an, it's one element of a situation which has become um, increasingly fraught. And as you said, uh, uh, Connor, uh, the US and China, they were the drivers of globalization um, over a whole period of time. And now they're the drivers of deglobalization. Uh, there's a, you know, there's a decoupling. That's the term that's actually used between uh, the U.S. and 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 China um, economically. I don't know. You probably have seen that in in China right now, the state is encouraging uh, consumer boycotts of uh, brands like H and M, um, who they are, are really caught. You know, I'm not saying I have any sympathy with them, but. They're caught in the, in the middle of this conflict because on the one side, they've been forced to say uh, that they condemn um, the treatment of the Uyghur people in, in Xinjiang. But by saying that, then they are incurring the wrath of the Chinese uh, state, and uh, which is encouraging people to, to boycott them. So 
you know, this is just one particular expression of, uh, of, of how the situation is leading to the breakup of, uh, of, of neoliberal globalization as we knew it, um, and even of global supply chains and the replacement of those with effectively regional uh, supply chains. So there are many, many consequences of this. And the working class is, you know, um, has no side in this, uh, in this conflict. Um, in fact, the whole thing is, is uh, detrimental to working people. Protectionism, um, the promotion of nationalism, our interests are international. And that's what we, uh, you know, that's why we are building an international. That's why we have an organization in China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and an organization in the U.S. and wherever else we can, we can set one up to express the common interests of working people against all imperialism and against the capitalist system itself. Thanks to our three panellists for this episode of Revolutionary Ideas, and thank you so much for tuning in and listening this month. Make sure that you follow us on all of our social media platforms, subscribe to our podcast channels, and tune in for next month. With that being said, see you soon. Goodbye.